So as this is uh, the interactive type of presentation, um, I wanted to uh, do my best to be brief and to present a data set that's somehow uh, somewhat immature. Uh, the data still requires a lot of analysis and input, and I'm hoping to uh, get a bit of that from, uh, from, from the participants today. So first of all, uh, as you all know, um, or, uh, and as P uh, P3 introduced earlier, uh, retinal uh, visual processing uh, arises from five classes of neurons. Photo detect receptors that detect light, the bipolar cells which separate the on and off signals, the retinal ganglion cells that digitize visual signals and project to the brain, uh, horizontal cells which were discussed uh, just now, and um, uh, amacrine cells that perform the uh, lateral processing. But and this is the image that we we see very often and that we brought in textbooks. But one thing that's missing is um, is uh, the, the, the neuroglia and vascular cells. So there's three different vascular plexi, plexi within the retina that, um, especially in the mammalian retina, that, that uh, uh, give nutrients, uh, oxygen to the, to the retina. And uh, these are uh, brought over by the um, neuroglia. So there's astrocytes, which exist in the um, nerve fiber layer and provide uh, support to uh, retinal ganglion cell axons. And also by Mueller glia, which are the transverse glia, which hold the retina together, provide uh, uh, metabolic support throughout the retina, and uh, also very importantly, recycle uh, glutamate, which is the main excitatory neurotransmitter of the CNS and also in the retina. Now, uh, in our lab, we're interested in um, studying the, the dynamics of these glial and vascular cells, as well as the neurons that, that perform the neural processing. So we generated this mouse line, which expresses GCAMP6F in all uh, types of cells in the retina. And we can image at different layers within the retina and then uh, record the spontaneous and light-driven calcium dynamics. So here you see some retinal ganglion cells responding to a pulse of light, um, as well as the, the vascular cells. So here, uh, some endothelial cells and parasites, which are uh, spontaneously uh, fluorescing uh, during the recording. But what I want to talk about today is the Mueller cells. Um, so uh, we found that uh, when we record at uh, low magnification, for extended periods of time, so uh, 10 minutes, so I was taking 10 minute recordings of the, of the ganglion cell layer, we can find spontaneous activity of um, spontaneously fluorescing Mueller glia. And uh, I performed these same recordings in a, a number of different ages. So at P10 during uh, stage two developmental waves, at P15 after eye opening, at P20 in the barely mature uh, visual system, and at P60 in, in an adult stage where the, the, the system is fully mature. And what I found is that the frequency of these spontaneous events uh, really uh, increases significantly after eye opening. So at P10, there's almost none of these, but at P15, 20, and 60, uh, you get a lot more. And uh, the duration, of these events seems to be uh, uh, always the same uh, or similar in the same ballpark, same as the distance traveled by these clusters uh, of glia. So with our microscope, we can actually investigate uh, within the layer of the retina. So we can look at the ganglion cell layer at the same time as the inner plexiform layer, the inner nuclear layer, uh, outer plexiform layer. We can really image as the objective is moving very, very fast and we're imaging these very slow uh, calcium transients. And what we found is that most of the, the signal is much stronger, deeper within the retina. So at the inner nuclear layer and at the plexiform layer. And um, we also modulated uh, these events with um, pharmacological agents. So as you may know, CNQX blocks uh, inotropic glutamate receptors and also the the, the, the off signals from the, from the photoreceptors to the bipolar cells. And these were able to completely abolish 
the retinal waves. TBOA, on the other hand, is a blocker of the um, glutamate, glutamate recycling uh, transport on the Muller glia. And when we block those, we flood the retina with glutamate and we, we have a, a significant increase in these waves, which hints at an origin, at the glutamatergic origin for these, for these spontaneous waves. Maybe as the retina is processing too much data, there's too much uh, glutamate, we don't know. But what we were able to really model them by adding a uh, webbing, which is the potassium ATPase blocker um, pump, which really uh, keeps the, um, the, 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 the neurons and glia at a specific uh, intracellular uh, concentration of ions. And there we have very, very strong signals. Um, and I'll show you examples uh, in both the ganglion cell layer and in the, um, in the, uh, in the nuclear layer these events are a lot more frequent as the retina uh, becomes completely unphysiological, but it's that same kind of radial um, coordinated uh, form that we observe, and we can really observe them much more frequently uh, in, this, in this state, which is uh, really get, gives us a much closer look at what's happening, and maybe we can, we can try and other types of um, pharmacological systems to, to modulate them somehow. Um, let me accelerate them a little bit for you guys. You can see there's a lot more of these things happen as the retina becomes a lot more physiological. Now, as I mentioned in the intro, there's still a lot of work to do. I need to improve my analysis pipeline. Uh, I need to look at different uh, pharmacological interactions. I need to, uh, I've got a lot of light responses, uh, experiments that I've performed and I need to analyze them. Um, uh, we, uh, we have established a line of retinal degeneration and I want to look at what glia are doing uh, as the retina deteriorates. And um, uh, we also want to set up in vivo to look at what uh, the cortical glia are doing and the cortical vascular cells are doing uh, in, in these different mice lines. Um, also, we're open to collaborations. And uh, also, if, you, if you're looking for a job, we've got some money. And, uh, and also, we were interested in people that are passionate about the retina and, and, and its function. And I'd like to thank my team uh, before um, ask if, uh, asking for asking questions. Um, thank you very much for your time and your attention. Thank you, Cyril. That was great. And uh, as Cyril mentioned, they have job openings, so apply, apply, apply. Um, I, as we wait for, oh, we have a question um, from Yun Lu, and he says, in blind mice with no visual input from birth, do you still get spontaneous glial calcium waves? If so, how are they different? So I've not, so I've, I've established the mouse line, but I've not actually performed any of the experiments. I'm, I'm aging the mice. So now they're about a year old, so they're severely degenerated. We've done some optokinetic reflex tests. So we know that they're fairly blind um, and I'm gonna start doing these experiments soon, but I'm very, very excited to see what's, what's happening inside these retinas. Yeah, um, I was wondering if uh, there is any type of synchrony between um, the Mueller glial cells that you imaged from and the other cells in the retina, are they signaling to each other in a very coordinated fashion? and also whether the synchrony is there early on during development and sort of becomes asynchronous, um, eventually similar to cortical circuits in a way. So um, during development, so what I'm not showing here um, is that at P10, we have obviously very strong um, spontaneous waves of activity in the ganglion cell layer. And uh, there is strong coordination between this and the vascular cells, which is another project I'm working on. But the Mueller glia appear not to really have any function at this stage. However, one thing that uh, I've observed, and again, I'm not sure exactly how to quantify it. Um, I'm trying different computational approaches, but I'm not sure how to quantify it or how to, how to describe it. But there does seem to be a lot of synchrony between the vascular cells and the glia. So when we see these waves of activity, let's see if I can trigger it as well here. We kind of see a, a bit of a flash first, 
um, uh, on the vascular branch. Maybe this is not the best example, as I have somewhere you can really see, you know, activity being started either in neurons, then, you know, that triggers a response in the vascular cells as they, you know, it's, they, they kind of um, give blood or in nutrients in vivo. This is obviously taken in ex vivo. And then we get that glial activity. So this is something also that I, I need to quantify. Um, yeah. It, so in your uh, manipulation experiment where you did the webbing experiment and you know you see this increased frequency um, of the of the spontaneous activity, I was wondering if in those manipulations you see the changes in the blood vessel dynamics, like you just mentioned. Uh, well, possibly. Um, no, it looks like here there's there's not much going on with the blood vessels. Uh, it it feels like these these glial events are happening kind of on their own. Um, but uh, the like the the the, the webbing situation is very unphysiological. You know, it's we're basically dysregulating everything, which completely. Uh, um, dysregulating the balance of, of, uh, of ionic potentials within each cell in the retina. So it's very hard to, it's very hard to kind of make, uh, make patterns from that. But yeah, just looking at this particular video, it seems like the vascular cells are not doing much. It's mostly the neurons and the glia. If anything, the vascular cells are becoming a lot more dim. Uh, I don't know if you can see, it's, it's a lot darker. Um, yeah. Whereas all the neurons kind of lift up, I think, as they, as they, as a lot of calcium comes into the cell. Right. So, if you manipulate, or do you plan to, let's say, manipulate these dynamics um, using, let's say, some mutant mice or uh, these the drugs that you have uh, injected, and look at what happens to retinal function later on in life? Uh, how does that? How do these early events um, produce adult function, sort of similar to what Xin Xin was describing in terms mm -hmm. of how the retinal waves uh, guide uh, later optic flow uh, properties. Well, one thing that I want to try, what one, so uh, I'm, so this, so Mueller cells are generally 14 microns across um, in diameter. But these things are about 50, 60, you know, these kind of rosettes. They, 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 they involve multiple clusters of glia. And one thing that I really want to try to do, uh, first pharmacologically, uh, and then maybe with different type of uh, light responses, is to um, decoordinate them. So to basically um, stop the spread, just generate a uh, activity, but that is completely either highly coordinated, or um, or but it doesn't spread in that fashion. And I think that's because they're connected by uh, gap junctions. And obviously, gap junctions are very important in um, uh, visual function. So uh, connexin 36, for example, is um, is heavily involved in the uh, on bipolar cell to uh, um, sorry in the rod. Uh, path rod to on bipolar cell pathway, and um, we got to identify which type of connexin it is connected to these these clusters, and if we can dysregulate them, then how will that actually impact uh, visual function? Is a question I'm really interested in. Very cool. Well, thank you. Um, I think that is just on time. Uh, so thank you, everyone. I'm going to thank all the three speakers again for the very, very wonderful presentations. It was Thanks, really Lee. very exciting listening to all of you. Um, and thank you to our audience for listening and posting their questions. And have a good day, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.